to quit going round and round. I hope it did. It's so funny. I have spent a couple of days preparing for this, and still, two o'clock sneaks up on me. I wonder if this is going to be true every time. Anyway, welcome to, to Time Out with Becky, and I do appreciate you taking time out of your day to join me. Um, today's topic is about fabric uh, bleeding and generally then from there fabric preparation. And what made me think of this was an email I got from Linda Sousa. And this is from her email. And she had a, um, a quilt made with cherrywood fabrics. Cherrywoods are hand dyes that yeah, I would probably always pre-wash cherry woods again, even though they've been laundered before you get them. Anyway, the pieces of fabric were too small for her to wash. She made the quilt. She washed it, and that happened. Um, and she said, what do you do? And I sometimes get these questions about what do you do when, um, when fabric bleeds. Oh, oh, I'm going to take a little bit of a moment right here. If anybody has comments, either in YouTube or um, YouTube or Facebook, feel free to add them in. I might have a window off to the side where they'll show. <laughs> that would be really nice. Anyway, back to this. So when I get questions about uh, questions from, from quilters about what do I do, mostly what I would do is consult the internet these days because I, I don't have this problem very often. Um, <clears throat> so I consulted the Google before recording this and it was interesting because the first hit, the first thing right there was pretty good. So I clicked on it and it took me to Suzy Quilts and this is, if you scroll down the page, if you do your own Googling, um, if you scroll down the page, she tells you what to do, and that's soak the quilting question in the tub. Lots of water. Lots of water, not, not less water. <clears throat> she says add Centropol. And I'll talk a little more about Centropol, but it is a professional chemical used to keep dye that's in the water from redepositing into the fabric. But there's also... Dawn Ultra Pure Dish Soap. And I think if you Google what to do with fabric that's bled, this is going to be a product that comes up a lot. It's relatively easy to find at your local stores. It's good. And you add that to the water and you soak and soak and soak. And if you get a lot of dye, you rinse it out and you do it again and you do it again and again and again. Um, letting the quilt soak for 12 hours or more in the water, and sometimes in very hot water. She suggests adding boiling water to the tub. So you do that until it comes clear, and then you take the quilt out of the tub after you've drained off all the water and you let it dry. Now, one of the things, oh, I see, I see your comment. Hi, Michelle. Cool, I know it works. Um, all right, so, so you, you take the quilt carefully out of the water because it's going to be heavy and you might want to have a white sheet as a sling at the bottom of the tub to help you pull the quilt out so that you don't damage it when you're doing that. I would not dry the quilt in, um, in the dryer if you're at all worried about this. And in fact, when you wash a quilt for the first time, taking it out of the washer and throwing it in the dryer and drying it is a problem because if dye migrates while it's still wet, the heat of the dryer is going to set it in. So if you're going to lay a quilt out to dry, outside works, although inside is sort of good. Lay a white sheet out, put the quilt on it, face up or down. If you put it face up, it's easier to see if the fabric's bleeding. And if it's outside, put another white sheet over it. Um, they dry remarkably quickly. Now, here's the thing. Remember I said I don't typically have a problem with my quilts bleeding, and it's because I always, always, always pre-wash my fabric. Always. 
<clears throat> so I'm going to walk you through the, the whys and the hows because it's important. Um, number one, please know that water chemistry will have an effect on how the dye behaves in your quilt, whether it bleeds or not. And Linda and I, back in the day, we tested this when she was in Colorado and I was in Texas. And <clears throat> fabric almost always bled for her. And, oh, everyone, and not so, not so much for me, because where I live, there's a lot of salt and chemicals in the water. So this is December when we're talking. And I got to thinking right before we started about the gifts many of us have made, quilted gifts to give to other people. If you did not pre-wash your fabric, and even if you did, and you've made a quilt for someone who lives outside of your water area, you might want to give them some tips on how to wash because fabric that might not bleed for you can bleed later somewhere else. So some of these tips that I'm giving you take into account always when you wash a quilt for the first time. Um, <clears throat> so what are you washing out besides excess dye? <clears throat> You're washing out the chemicals that if you ever again get to walk into a quilt store where there's lots of fabric, you know when you walk into a place like this and um, and it makes your eyes water or your nose run. And, um, oh, click to view. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to not do that. Sorry, you can tell this is live and I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing here, but good to know. Okay, so, I mean, comment wise, I don't know what I'm doing. Fabric wise, got it nailed. All right, back to this. The chemicals that in a fabric shop might make your nose run or your eyes water, those are in the fabric. I don't want them in my house, so I want those washed out. I want to wash out the sizing and chemicals, the sizings that make the fabric slick, because slick fabric can be harder to work with in both piecing and applique. I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, the other thing I want to talk to you about is shipping is an industry. So our fabrics are made in many cases overseas and they're shipped to us. And I know too many people who have written me who work in the shipping industry and they say, it's nasty. You know, there's insects, there's rats, there's stuff. Now, is the fabric you've just bought off the boat infested with icky stuff? Maybe not exactly specifically, but has it been exposed to icky stuff there and in the factories and the places where fabric is rolled onto bolts and where it's stored? Oh yeah, I want all that washed out. I don't want it in my house. So fabric comes in, it gets washed. How do I wash it? I use, oh, and now I get to touch props. So, Corvus paste, this stuff. Um, you can buy it by the gallon. You can also buy it in smaller jars, about, you know, smaller jars, um, at quilt shops. You'll sometimes see something in a cylindrical jar and it says quilt soap, and if you read real close, it'll say it's Corvus paste. In a high efficiency machine, you use about a teaspoon of Orvis per washer load, mixed with water, poured down the water, the, the detergent sheet. And when it's cold, it becomes a solid. When it's warm, it is a viscous liquid. And it takes forever to use up a gallon. Um, you can also use this on pretty much any natural fiber, cotton, wool, whatever. Good stuff. All right. If you don't want to mess with Orvis, and honestly, sometimes I don't want to mess with Orvis. More often than not, these days, I use Retro Wash. Because, oh, wait. I get to turn this so you can see not just that, but you can see the little words marking across the, the thing. Um, so I use Retro Wash. It is a powder, and 
it's really designed to be like Orbis, so it contains both of these. No dyes, phosphates, optical brighteners, or perfumes. It doesn't leave a residue. It's safe for sensitive skin, low sudsing, biodegradable, highly concentrated. So in for hand, you can use this for hand washing. In a standard high-efficiency washer, you use one tablespoon per large load. So I put the fabric in and I sprinkle the retro wash on top. Works like a charm. All right, then what if you don't want either of those? What if you just want to use this? Well, you can kind of use this too. And in a pinch, if I'm out of the other two, I'll use this because it doesn't have a lot of the bad stuff. So no dyes, no perfumes. It probably does have a little bit of softening agents. And I actually don't want softening agents in my fabric. I just want it clean. So in a pinch, okay, but it's not my favorite thing. All right, so that's like the soapy part that goes in the washer with the fabric. Then there's Central Pollen Retain. These are the two professional chemicals. I have to figure out how to turn this. So Synthrapol is the chemical that you use, this is great for hand dyes, um, to keep the dye that gets in the water from redepositing. And it says for machine wash, set it for the hot cycle. Now know that they really want hot. Um, and most of our hot water heaters are not set for hot, right? Um, it says add one to two teaspoons, teaspoons per load, just enough, enough to form a quarter inch of suds. I don't actually look in my laundry washer to know if it's making suds or not. I've used this, and actually I don't use it by itself. I use it with the other stuff. I don't know if that's good or bad. It's just what I do. Um, so, Centropol. Then there's Retain, and Retain is the color fixative. It's supposed to keep the dye in the, um, in the fabric, which is really nice. It says, for best results, treat fabric with Retain before washing it for the first time or placing it into your quilt. I put it in with the soap. Maybe I should quit doing that. Um, so this one also says... It wants hot water, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a lot. Um, let's see here. Machine applications. On the last bottle of this, yeah, right there, hand directions, one teaspoon of retain for each yard of fabric. And the machine application says use the same amount. So hot water wash, cool water rinse, one teaspoon per yard of fabric. So when I'm using this, I count out my yardage as I'm putting it in, or if I'm washing a quilt, I just sort of guess. And I use this with the soap, which maybe I should do them separately, but you know, really, I'm kind of lazy. I'm, this seems like enough. All right, so let's see what's next. Oh, and then there's color catchers. These are amazing, and I think if you're not in the U.S., you might have trouble getting these. They're made by Shout. They go in the washer with your fabric, with the soap, and they behave a little bit like Synthropol in that they gather up the excess dye while you're washing. Now, I got to tell you, first, I thought that if it came out and it was dark, then I got all the dye and that was it. I've since come to understand that really you should wash your fabric until the color catcher, or single or plural, um, come out clear. That means there is fabric that's been washed in my stash that is maybe not safe. But then again, when I wash a quilt for the first time, even if I pre-washed it, I don't really think it's safe exactly, I still would watch it when I dry it. 
All right. I will get back to how these work together, but the other thing I want to talk to you about, okay, so this is, these are the things you use when you wash your fabric to make it be clean and to help set the dye. Yes, in the washer, the fabric knots up. That just happens. And yes, it ravels. So what I do when I'm washing fabric is I open the washer and anything fat quarter size or bigger, I have just thrown in. If it's a little bitty, I put it in a um, lingerie bag. Um, so, so I cut off all the threads and I set them aside. And then I smooth out the fabric and I throw it in the dryer and I dry it. Um, kind of on warm because cotton shrinks. Now... For those of you, and I know there's a ton of you, I know, I know more than half of you guys watching this, you never pre-wash your fabric because people have gotten out of the habit. It used to be what we always did back in the day, and then it became not what we do. I, I really think it needs to go back to where it was because if you are not used to washing your fabric, you think that it all shrinks the same, and it doesn't. And you probably think it shrinks not that much. How much could it shrink, right? Not that much. All right, so I had, I had in the other room one of these mask panels. So this is fabric that I had in there, and I decided, okay, I'll use this as a test. I still have some of this, by the way. So I washed it. Now, the fabric that hasn't been washed, you'll notice it has a kind of silky feel and finish. It's, it's fabric off, off the bolt. The fabric that I've washed has a much different feel to it. The nap of the fabric has been raised. The colors are still good, but they're different. They're not that slick, shiny finish that you get off the bolt. Some people really like that slick, shiny look, but here's the thing. If you are making a quilt that is going to get washed, don't you want to know what the fabric's going to look like in your finished quilt before you've sewn it in? I mean, what if it washes up and you don't like the look of it? That would be bad. I'd rather know. All right, so I'm going to match up this, this end and track across the fabric to this side to show you how much it shrank side to side. Oops, sorry, right there. Now, what's really funny, that is not quite two inches. I've done this test before with the same fabric off of different bolts and it shrunk more. So, my motor rep told me years ago that the same fabric on different bolts can behave differently. And I've never really seen that happen in the real world until this. Who knew? So fabric, when it's woven, it's the, the warp is lengthwise down the, down the thing. The, the warp is, and so those threads are pulled tighter. The crosswise uh, weft, I think, is um, there's not quite as much tension on it. When you wash fabric, it shrinks more from side to side than it does lengthwise. So here's this fabric that shrunk across a 40 inch width, not quite two inches that lengthwise across about 20 inches, it shrunk a lot less. Okay, what this tells you is that, let's say you're buying layer cakes or charm squares or whatever these squares are, or you're cutting squares to make quilts out of. If you're cutting tiny, tiny little pieces, okay, maybe the shrinkage isn't gonna be that big a deal. But the bigger your pieces get, 
knowing that they don't shrink uniformly from side to, you know, this way or that way, well, that can be bad. The other thing is that, um, what is the other thing? <laughs> it's the danger of working live. Okay, so it shrinks. There was one other thing I was going to say about that. It'll either come to me or it won't. And if it does, you'll hear because I'll, I'll go backwards. So, um, whoo, falling off my stool. So it, it shrinks disproportionately. Oh, and that was the other thing. And you can't be sure, you know, how the bolts are going to react. So when you are making a quilt, let's say you're using big squares and you don't get the grain right and it shrinks one shrinks more this way one shrinks more that way depending on how you quilted it and all other things it's a problem and then think about panel quilts where you've got single single lengths of fabric next to piecing or think about how you piece quilt backs um oh lorna tells me Lorna tells me, here we go, you know the mask fabric that I've got back there, and if anybody has a good cause that they want to um, have mask fabric for, let us know, because what we've got until it's gone, we'll, we'll send it to you. Okay, so back to this. So you've got to really think about how your fabric's used and how it's going to shrink and how that will affect your finished quilt. All right, so cotton shrinks. Yeah, I forgot to go forward, but I've walked you through that. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing about when you wash the sizings off. I said that it feels different and it looks different. When fabric has been washed in the washer and dried in the dryer and the nap is raised, when you put that fabric together, it stays where you put it. So when you are sewing, you know, you're feeding this through your sewing machine, you get a lot less walking between the layers. I find it to be much easier to piece. I like it better in my applique too, because when I'm layering applique shapes on top of each other and I want to pin or um, just hold them in place while I'm getting ready to pin, they stay put. When I layer and baste a quilt, those layers stay put. So if you notice that you have, pro well, if you don't ever pre-wash your fabric, you may not know <laughs> that you're having problems with your fabric moving apart. You should give it a go. The other thing is that when you've got fabric that's been washed and dried, and this is, uh, this is the sizzle quilt, by the way. It's on my design wall. The fabric here was washed and dried before I made it. I want you to look what I can do. When you are working with fabric that is not fresh off the bolt, it'll stick to itself. So designing on the design wall is so much easier. Now, you can't see it, but my back door is right over there. And so when the back door opens and there's a breeze, yeah, even that would probably blow off. But so I do use pins, but if I didn't have the back door right there, and if I didn't have cats who sometimes pick them off and <laughs> run with the pieces, I would never have to pin. It's really nice. All right. So it feels different. It's a smaller size after you wash it, the fabric it feels different easier to work with. What's not to like? Smells better, feels better, and you know it's clean. Okay, so I bought, not long ago, I bought some wonderful fabric. It's um, Jane Sassaman's new handcrafted, hand-dyed cottons. So it's from Free Spirit, comes on a bolt, but it was hand-dyed by Free Spirit wherever it is they do it. And I got care instructions that you can see here. <clears throat> and it was interesting because I knew I was going to pre-wash it anyway. But there it says, you can see, they recommend the following. 
uh, pre-wash in hot water with Centerpol. And see, they're calling Centerpol a detergent. I guess maybe I could quit using the detergent with the Centerpol. Although, I don't know. We can all try it and see how it works. Um, so that's what it says. Basically, wash with Centerpol. So these are the fabrics I got. And, and it was sort of random, but I decided this group were the darks. And I washed them first. Oops, I knocked the table where the camera is. All right, there we go. So I washed these first. And I used Centerpol, but I also threw in a color catcher. And that's how it came out. And I thought to myself, that is a lot of dye. So I decided to do something different. Um, a few years back, a hand dyer, and I wish I could remember who it was, told me to always wash my hand dyed fabric with Retain and not Centerfall. So I tore off, I cut off the threads, I opened it back out, I put the wet fabric in the washer with Retain and another color catcher, and the color catcher came out like this. And that's the thing. Usually when I'm washing stuff, I will use center polar retain. Oh no, forget that. I mostly use um, the soap. I use retro wash and retain and one or two color catchers. And by and large, the color catchers always come out clear. Now, that mask fabric that I had to wash so that I could show you how much it shrank, I decided to do another test. So I put these fabrics back in the wash with that washed mask fabric. No Centerfall, no Retain, I used Retro Wash, but I threw in two color catchers. So on, that would have been the third wash on this, the color catchers came out clear. What that tells me is mostly, that's what I'm using. I'm going to use Retro Wash and Retain when I wash my fabric and probably when I wash my quilts. I am not a chemist. I'm a quilt. I'm a quilter. <laughs> so I am um, making decisions based on my personal experience and that's what I'm sharing with you. All right. Now, this is what I have figured out while I'm doing this, is that if I'm talking to you, I cannot at the same time read the comments. So, if anybody, does anybody have a question? If, if you do, if you have a burning question, type it in right now and I can see the bottom. I don't think I can scroll through to the top to know um, what else, what else might be there. But, oh, let me see here. Let's see if this works just because you're with me here. Let's see. No, I don't know. There's supposed to be a way. Look! Hello, So So Studio Tracy. Yes, I think that's on, on the screen now. Um, I think, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna make it go away because, because, <laughs> thanks for making a comment because I wasn't sure if that would work. I'm still not. Look at that. This is a stunner. I'm almost to the 30 minute mark. I don't know how I did that, but that's really wonderful because 30 minutes, I think, is about what we've all got. Um, oh, good. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Um, what about, oh, good question. What about starching? That's, there's one. Let's put that up. Um, starching. I don't. I don't add starch. I don't add, um, I don't add any of those squirty things. I really don't. I don't think they're necessary. When I wash it in the washer, and then I undo it, and I throw the fabric in the dryer, and when it's dry, I pull it out, and I fold it immediately, and I put it in my closet. And when I am ready to use it, if it needs, um, if it needs pressing, as this really will, then I press it, and I press with steam, and I squirt with water. There are, you know, I've washed out all those chemicals. I don't want to put more in. And I have 
Okay, so, so let's go back to this. Making it easier to sew. There are reasons. <laughs> there are possible reasons for that. Look at your sewing machine. Um, I didn't realize how much difference it makes to the way you can control the fabric in your machine, how much the width of the feed dogs matters. So old machines, um, older machines, the feed dogs were always five millimeter, but somewhere in there, maybe 20 years ago, when uh, embroidery and, and machine quilting, free motion quilting started coming on big, the machine manufacturers moved the feed dogs farther apart to accommodate wider stitches. When the feed dogs are farther apart, there are times when the presser foot on top of those feed dogs miss one or both of the, of the feed dogs below the fabric. If you've got a nine millimeter machine, you know, and, and if you don't know, pull out a ruler and look. If your feed dogs are nine millimeters apart, when you put on your quarter inch foot, the right feed dog is likely to be to the right, away from the right edge of your foot. Even if you have a top feed, what happens is you put the machine, you put the um, you put the fabric in and the left feed dog and the top feed grab that fabric and pull it that away. They just yank. Uh, you know, I, I had no idea that was true until I tried it on a test machine. Um, it's a problem. It's a real problem. If I, it's why I don't own a machine with nine millimeter feed dogs because I don't do embroidery. I don't need it. Okay, back to this. If you have a machine with um, that kind of width on your feed dog, use the wider foot, I think on a Bernina it's the number one foot, and move your needle. You know, find that quarter inch spot so that the bottom feed dogs are underneath the foot that's above it and you will have a lot more control. If you, Otherwise, yeah, that's probably one reason why people have opted in for all this really stiff fabric. But the, the thing is, the chemicals you're putting into the fabric to make it stiff, you probably need to be washing those out. And then you're back to the problem with dye migration. So that's why I, I don't. I don't. I'm kind of a purist. Uh, uh, okay. Tracy says, ooh, let's do this. Tracy says she adjusts the pressure of the foot. Yeah, that might work, but still, you're going to get that sideways drag. And it's funny, so I, I do a lot of machine piecing. I'm more a hand sewer than a machine sewer, or have been over the last many years. But I know people who do precision piecing, and they have said the same thing as me. So um, there you go. Give it a go. Give it a try. Um, compare and contrast. And what we all need to do is find the things that work for us and then share it with other quilters. I think that's it. Answering questions put me a little over 30 minutes, but I love answering questions. It means you're there and I appreciate that. Um, I think that's it. I don't know, oh I know. So you guys let me know if there's anything you'd like me to talk about. I've got a list going and I don't remember what I'm talking about next week. It might be notions. It might be. I've had a variety of questions about notions. That may be where we go. Uh, this, if you want to email me, is my email address, becky.pieceofcake at gmail.com. And I think that's it. I think that's a wrap. So thank you so much for joining me on this second timeout session. I look forward to seeing you next week. So, happy stitching. Bye-bye.